Hey, I'm so glad you decided to join us here on Tuesday, January the 26th. Let's begin with prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this Bible study, this opportunity to come before you in prayer and devotion and learn a little bit more what you would have us know about your world and about your love for it. For you ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, I know I'm probably being a little bit distracting right now with my t-shirt, right? You can see it's a Hercules shirt and Disney, Disney-fied version of Hercules. Hercules was not a nice person, by the way, in the real myths about Hercules. He was actually insane. When I say insane, I mean the man was insane. You know that love story he had with Megara? Oh, yeah, he killed her. But nevertheless, Disney did this wonderful version, which is one of my favorite Disney movies, and I want you to picture for a minute that light, airy, uh, wonderful storytelling of Disney or of Veggie Tales and apply it to Jonah. Because that's what this story is. It is a funny, humorous, lovely story that's already been Veggie Tailed for us by the author of the book. But we're going to come back to that. Let's first of all start with Jonah. And the setting. Now, the setting of the book of Noah, uh, Nineveh, <clears throat> Jonah, pardon me, is supposed to be in a city called Nineveh, which is the capital of Assyria in the 8th century BC. Okay? So, this is a long time ago. This is 3,000 years ago. All right? So, Nineveh, again, is the capital city of Assyria. Assyria was, for a time, the big bad on the market. It was the superpower for a very short period of time until it was overthrown by another country. But Assyria also has, is noted for uh, being the country that overthrew the northern tribes of Israel. You might remember that uh, Israel split in two after Solomon because the northern tribes no longer wanted to follow in the Davidic line, or they at least they wanted to follow a different king. And so they separated his countries, the northern tribes, and then you, you had Israel, the northern tribes of Israel, and then you had Judah, the southern tribes. And then, of course, the northern tribes were destroyed by this country. So they represent <clears throat> in the Bible everything that is evil and bad and threatening to the people of Israel. Now, here's the interesting thing. There are a lot of what we call anachronistic anachronisms, anachronistic features of the book of Jonah that kind of are an indication, ding, 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 this is not a straight historical narrative that we are meant to read as though this actually happened in the 8th century B.C., Okay? <clears throat> Some of those, anach and, and when I say anachronistic, let me, it's kind of like going to a Renaissance festival out here in Pittsburgh. <clears throat> you know that's not really what the medieval days looked like. It's just a lot of tongue-in-cheek. It's supposed to be a lot of fun. You will see somebody who's, I don't know, uh, wearing a, a, a lapel, or a Star Trek communicator on their lapel, or something like that, or just crazy stuff that just, or, you know, I've actually seen somebody dressed up as Captain Kirk walking through a Renaissance festival because it was funny, okay? It's anachronistic. It doesn't belong there, but it would be a very Star trek type of thing to do. So um, there are anachronistic things that take place in the book of Jonah that tell us this really wasn't written in the 8th century B.C., for instance, one of the things that they tell you is in the book, Jonah, that there are 120,000 uh, people who live in the city of Nineveh. There was never that many people that lived in the city of Nineveh. And it's a three-day walk across Nineveh. It was never a three-day walk. You know, that would, that would mean the city is probably about 60 miles from end to end. It was never that big of a city. At its strength, at its might, at its biggest size, it was seven miles across. That was it. That includes all the suburbs. So it was never as big as the book of Jonah claims that it is. We know this from archaeology. And uh, we know this from 
Nineveh itself, we have a lot of records. In fact, Nineveh, we have a lot of wonderful historical records directly from Nineveh. We know that it was never this size. So they're anachronistic things. Uh, lots of other things. The word for sailors is something that is very late. It's not something that you would find in Hebrew dating back to the 8th century. There are Aramaic phrases. The Jews didn't come really speak Aramaic, or Aramaic didn't really creep into the Jewish uh, ways of speaking until after the post or until the post-exilic days. And so um, these types of things indicate to us very clearly that this was not written in the 8th century. We have no clue who wrote it. Chances are it's one of the final books of the Bible written. It was likely written sometime in the 3rd century BC, somewhere around 250, give or take. We don't really know. We can't possibly know these things. But here's then the question. So this is a story about a guy who lived in 800 B.C., probably written about 250 B.C. Is it a true story? Did Jonah exist? And I'm going to answer this in a very Pastor Dave way. Who cares? Oh, Pastor Dave doesn't believe the Bible. You know, Jesus told an awful lot of parables. I don't believe that any of them actually happened. They were stories, and yet they are scripture. Jesus told stories that weren't true stories based upon real life feeling type of events. Maybe you could, you could relate to some of these things, but they weren't true stories. So is Jesus a liar? No, of course not. Jesus said, the smallest of all seeds is the mustard seed. Boulder Dash. Jesus even knew that's not true scientifically because at the time of Jesus they understood that there were smaller seeds in a mustard seed. This is a phrase that was common amongst Jewish uh, uh, philosophical speaking and so forth, parabolic speaking and so forth. Um, so did Jonah exist? It doesn't really matter. He could have. That is not a lack of belief by the way. I believe that everything in the book of Jonah, God could have done. I just look at the literature and how the story of Jonah is written, and I come to the conclusion that I don't think that's our point. It's not written like a, in a historical narrative. Now, I know you pick up an English Bible, and you open it up, and you start reading, and you say, it looks like a historical narrative to me. That's because you're reading a translation of the Hebrew. If you read the Hebrew, you realize something very quickly about it. It's a hilarious book. It's not an historical narrative. It does, isn't written like an historical narrative. It is written like a veggie tale. So I think veggie tales actually did a take on Jonah. So they veggie tailed a veggie tale. Something is already written like a veggie tale. That's a double veggie tale, veggie tale. It is a hilarious story. The ship in the book of Jonah is personified. Now, you don't see this in English, but it groans and it creaks and it speaks back and it doesn't like Jonah very much. And it wants him off the ship. It's a personified being. The, the sailors are these, are these caricatures. They're no, they, you, know, you wouldn't have known a sailor like this, but they're these caricatures of these fearful, uh, superstitious characters on these ships. Jonah himself, oh my goodness, you could not pick a worse candidate to be a prophet than Jonah. Why would God choose this guy? Well, it's a literary device. This guy is, well, let's put it this way. Jonah is kind of like, uh, to prophets, like Johnny English is to James Bond, okay? If you've ever seen the James Bond or the Johnny English movies, they're just a farce, a spoof on, on James Bond. Or to Leslie, Leslie Nielsen in, in Naked Gun uh, is to uh, police detectives, okay? That's Jonah. Jonah is the biggest buffoon you could possibly run into. But just like Johnny English and just like the Leslie Nielsen character and Naked Gun, he always gets to where he's supposed to go. But there's a lot of hilarity that ensues in between. That's the book of Jonah. 
And so when you read the book of Jonah, I want you to veggie tail it, okay? I want you to picture the ship groaning and complaining and griping and these characters as larger than life, Jonah being this big buffoon that he is. And understand that somehow God is trying to communicate something important to us. I believe that this story was written for children. It is a children's book that parents would tell the story to their children and they would communicate to their children how God values everyone. But the person who's a butt of a joke is a prophet, a Jewish prophet. And the heroes in this case are... Oh, I'm sorry, folks. I guess I still have my ringer on. I apologize for that. Um, so the, the heroes in this case are actually the people who repent in the city of Nineveh, not the people that you would expect. So uh, is it true? I, I, I don't know. Could be. If you want to believe it's true, that's fine. It has nothing to do, by the way, with can, can uh, Jonah be swallowed by a big fish? It never says whale, by the way. A big fish could have been whale, but a fish isn't, you know, whatever. Um, so was it a whale? Was it a big fish? Who knows? Did this really happen? You know, there's, you know, certainly evidence uh, 2019. You can YouTube this one. There's a man, I don't remember his name. You can watch it on YouTube, a man who gets swallowed by a whale and escapes. It happened. It's on YouTube. It must be believable. you got to believe it. It's true, right? Or there's a guy, I think, in the 1800s. Um, I, let me look this up. I actually wrote this down. James Bartley was his name. The, the, the theories are, uh, his, the story goes that he was swallowed by a whale and spent several days in the belly of this whale, and then finally this whale was killed by uh, folks who were hunting the whales, and uh, ultimately when they opened up the stomach, this man was still alive. I, is it a true story? You know, James Bartley claims it true. Uh, the fisherman who, who uh, fished for this uh, whale claims it was true, so maybe. And, you know, scientists even say it's plausible that a guy could actually survive. The, the, the odd thing is there ain't no sperm whales in Nineveh. It's on the Euphrates River. And so this whale spits Jonah up, or this fish, on, uh, off of the Euphrates River, off the coast of Nineveh. That doesn't mean that God could do it? Sure. But like I said, the style of literature, to me, indicates that we are to understand this as a veggie tale and as something that's funny and hilarious, but yet God still communicates to us through this story. So... Let's take a look at this. We're actually going to just look at a portion of it. At some point, I'd like to go through all of it because there is some wordplay. There's so much wordplay going on in Jonah. It's just a brilliant piece of literature as well as a, uh, uh, the scripture. So it's a both and. It's a brilliant piece of literature. It's also a beautiful piece of scripture. I love the book of Jonah. And I'm going to tell you why I love the book of Jonah. Because Jonah's me. Okay? really a buffoon sometimes. There are days I'm like, oh, Dave, that was so stupid. That was dumb. I can't believe I did that. This is Jonah. I see myself in Jonah more times than you can possibly imagine. That unwillingness to do what God calls you to do. The running the opposite direction. And God is always going to get you, right? God doing some spectacular things to put you in a position where even though you are unwilling... God blesses people through you. That's the story of Jonah. It's a spectacular story. It's a great story. It's a wonderfully written piece of literature. And it's the Word of God. It is all of those things. So, let's take a look at our lesson, this portion of the lesson. It's kind of excerpted, so we don't see the buffoonery so much here. But let me tell you, uh, this part of the story where Jonah basically runs the other direction when God calls him, and he wants to go to, uh, to, a, to a different city, and he jumps on a ship, and that ship groans against him and struggles against the wind that God sends against him. Jonah eventually is thrown overboard. He gets swallowed by this whale. The whale, by the way, when we say that word Jonah and the whale, you automatically fill that in. The whale, or the big fish, is three verses. And a bigger book. Three verses. We make it like it's the whole book. It's a very minor part of the book. It's a delivery mechanism to spew Jonah on the shores of Nineveh. 
okay? It's a way to get him from the way he's going to where he's going to be, and it's supposed to be a spectacular thing because, again, it's a reminder, you know, God's not going to let you get away with that. It's hilarious, okay? It's supposed to be funny. So he finally gets where he's going to be, and he's on shore, and God says the second time, you are going to do this whether you want to or not, Jonah. You have to go to Nineveh and tell them to repent because they've gone in the wrong direction. Now, Jonah doesn't want to do this. Remember who I told you, what does the Nineveh represent? Forces and destruction. Uh, these, these, this working of evil. They are a powerful, destructive force. Okay? And so he doesn't want to go here. There's no love lost between the Jews and Nineveh. So here we go. So here he is. He's been vomited out on the shore. <sighs> The Lord spoke to Jonah a second time. Get up. Go to the great city of Nineveh. Deliver the message I've given to you. This time Jonah obeyed. Well, you know what? That's not bad. For me, sometimes it takes three or four times. So he obeyed the command of, went to, of the Lord and went to Nineveh, a city so large that it took three days to see it all. To watch walk across it, depending on the translation. Again, we already indicated... It wasn't that big of a city. You could have walked around the whole thing in a half a day. Okay? On the day that Jonah entered into the city, he shouted at the crowds, 40 days from now, Nineveh will be destroyed. You can imagine he relished in this message. That was the message. He was looking forward to this. We'll get into that in a minute because Jonah actually pulls up his popcorn and, you know, pulls up a chair and sits on the edge of a, of a hill to watch its destruction. You know, this is entertainment, I guess, in 8th century B.C. Don't know. Anyway, so people need to have believed God's message. From the greatest to the least, they declared a fast, put on burlap to show their sorrow. When the king of Nineveh, now there's, there's an anachronism, the king of Nineveh, they never called him the king. Okay, so that's an anachronistic phrase that doesn't really apply to Syria. Assyria, pardon me, not Syria. Syria came after Assyria. Um, so when the king of Nineveh heard what Jonah was saying, he stepped down from his throne and took off his royal robes. He dressed himself in burlap and sat on a heap of ashes. The king and his nobles, that's an anachronistic phrase too, because this would never have happened in Assyria. Okay, this was more a 250 B.C. type of thing that would happen. The king and his nobles sent his decree throughout the city. All right? No one, not even the animals from your herds and flocks, may eat or drink anything at all. Another anachronistic thing. Animals back in the 8th century were not included in the fast. But it was much more common around the 2nd century, 3rd century. People and animals alike must wear garments of mourning. It's kind of a silly image. If you imagine animals wearing, like, like, what did they do? Can you imagine putting burlap on your dog? Yeah, right. Like, that's going to happen. It's funny, okay? So, they're going to wear garments of mourning, and everyone must pray earnestly to God. They must turn from their evil ways, stop all of their violence. Who can tell? Perhaps yet. God might change his mind, hold back his fierce anger from destroying us. And when God saw everything that they'd done, and how they put a stop to their evil ways. He changed his mind and did not carry out the destruction that he had threatened. Okay, so this kind of ends in a very straight note. I mean, it sounds like a very serious lesson, and it kind of is. Because this lesson teaches us about the graciousness of God. God wants, God wants to have mercy. But it is our attitude, our violence, that often prevents that message of mercy being heard by us. Okay? So this is the serious message of the book of Jonah. There's something serious going on here. Now, it gets silly again in a minute. I already told you that Jonah, he pulls up his chair, his lounge chair, sits underneath a big bush, leafy bush that God made for him. He pulls up his popcorn, whatever equivalent to that, and he sits there and he waits for the destruction of Nineveh, and when it doesn't happen, Jonah starts whining, God, now I look like an idiot. See, Jonah was more upset about the fact that God, that, that God didn't destroy Nineveh because it makes him look bad. <laughs> you know, he, he, he would rather everybody in the seat of Nineveh be killed so he looks good than for the people to be spared. 
He cared more about his reputation than he did about the people of Nineveh. <laughs> I'm already telling you, this is me sometimes. There are times I get calls into the church and people want something from me and I'm like, oh, just leave me alone. I've actually said that. My daughter's heard me say that. My wife has heard me say that. Anybody who knows me has heard me say that. No, I don't do that all the time. I don't want to keep you from calling me. I have compassion and, and, and I love you all and I love the people that call, but there are times it's just really annoying. I am Jonah. Okay? I'm that buffoon. But sometimes God still uses me anyway. Alright? This is the amazing thing about this lesson. So, what does this mean? Again, God's mercy is extended to the most unlikely. And that's the amazing thing about the story of the book of Jonah. This is what parents were likely trying to teach their children. The God of the Jews is a God who loves everybody, even those whom we have written off. Grace is not the exclusive possession of the Jews or of us Christians, those who go to church every Sunday. It's meant to be given away. See, here's what God does. God fills you up, and this is what Jonah forgot. God filled him up with grace and mercy. He says, now go pour it out. God, I'm not giving away grace and mercy. I might need that later. Are you kidding? It's not grace and mercy if you hold it to yourself. It's meant to be shared. And, you know, here's the concern that I have. Sometimes, this, because this lesson is still pertinent today, sometimes we Christians really don't like God's mercy. We relish in God's destruction. I, I, I will tell you, I was just talking to my, well, I would, you know, we were talking, my wife and I, to my mother-in-law, and she was going on about, uh, watching this pastor who's talking about the end times and how awful things are, how horrible Christians are going to be treated here real soon in this country, and blah, 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 blah. I'm like, why are you listening to this? Why? There are some pastors who like to just get us enraged. Oh, I can't believe how horrible things are in my life. That person didn't say Merry Christmas back to me. Oh, I'm so oppressed. You know? The Christians in Ethiopia, just a week ago, the government of Ethiopia, just slaughtered 150 Christians in their church. Oh, and we're so oppressed because people don't say Merry Christmas to thee. We have such an outsized uh, or distorted understanding of what oppression is. We're not being oppressed in the United States. Okay? You're not being oppressed. True oppression. You want to see true oppression? Look at the Christians in Ethiopia. Okay? You are not going to lose your life because you're going to church on Sunday. <laughs> we oftentimes make ourselves the martyr of our own stories. And we do things that just truly are not loving. And we wonder why people in the U.S. rebel against us. Huh. We don't understand God's mercy and kindness. We are Jonah. We are the buffoon sometimes. And God is calling us to take a look at ourselves. It's a marvelous thing about this story. It just reverses everything you think you know is right and true. The great prophet is a big buffoon. The evil people understand enough to repent. And God has mercy. <laughs> Let's pray. Heavenly Father, what a wonderful lesson this is. Thank you so much for speaking this word to us today. May it inspire us and touch us and transform our lives. We thank you for the word of God. We thank you for uh, the prophet Jonah. And we just thank you for the lesson that he teaches us. Buffoons we may be. You still use us to bless the world. Help us to change our attitude towards it. We ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you, be gracious to you. May the Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Hey, go read the book of Jonah. Vegetalize it, okay?
understand that it's supposed to be a fun, humorous book and see yourself in the buffoon, Jonah, because that's who we are. But God amazingly still uses us. Go in peace.